I'm your host today, Ben Spradling, and I am really excited about today's topic, what employers need to know about COVID-19 vaccination requirements. So I will, uh, I'll introduce you to our expert speakers here in just a moment, but before I do, I wanted to go over some of the housekeeping items for those who uh, uh, may be joining us for the first time today. So resources like these webinars, those are made possible by our BBB accredited businesses. So those are businesses that have taken a pledge to uphold eight standards of trust, really to act with integrity in the marketplace. So we wanna thank them today for their dedication to furthering BBB's mission and vision and helping making these webinars possible for, uh, for everybody in the business community to enjoy. We've got Amy Robinson of Miller Nash, Graham and Dunn. She represents public and private employers throughout Oregon and Washington in a broad range of workplace related issues. She skillfully handles matters for clients regarding wage and hour leave laws, disability and accommodation and complaints related to discrimination, retaliation and harassment. Amy is adept at guiding employers through policy and handbook creation, crafting employment contracts, and various other agreements. Amy is joined today by Yvonne Resendez Gutierrez. He is a litigation and appellate attorney on Miller Nash Graham and Dunn's appellate education and employment and labor relations practice teams. Yvonne advises employers on knotty employment related issues, including discrimination, harassment, retaliation, unemployment insurance benefits, including shared work benefits and wage and hour compliance, and on uh, preparing employment documents such as employment agreements, handbooks, and other workplace policies. Uh, before joining Miller, Nash, Graham, and Dunn, Yvonne served as a judicial clerk for the Honorable Lynn R. Nakamoto at the Oregon Supreme Court and Oregon Court of Appeals. Amy and Yvonne, thank you both for joining us today. I will turn the stage over to you. All righty, um, we're gonna talk about vaccinations today and things to think about if you're contemplating a vaccine mandate for your workplace and your employees. Interestingly, we were just talking kind of offline. It was July of, of this last year, which feels about 10 years ago, where I was talking to you and joined you all for a discussion around reopening. So here we are, look how fast we're reopening. Now we're talking about vaccines. So, um, and I'm excited because um, we we're hoping that there's some complex topics here. There are some gray areas, certainly, but we're hoping we'll give you some firm, um, some firm considerations to be making as you weigh those difficult decisions and a framework to work from. And we're gonna hopefully make it a little fun. The, uh, the dinosaur in the corner of the screen will reveal itself in time. This is as many things in, in the COVID-19 arena there are is lots of, of moving parts. There are a number of laws and regulations that may intersect. Some of the guidance around it is, is changing. So hopefully today we'll give you some firm takeaway, kind of a framework, as I said, to work from um, so that you can start weighing in on where you want to come down on this issue. Yvonne, I'll let you tee us off here. Thank you. Thank you, Amy. Yes. So the, the question that we're going to be handling today and that seems to be on, on everyone's mind um, for, for the last uh, at least couple months now is whether employers can require their employees to be vaccinated against uh, COVID-19 as a condition uh, of employment, meaning can we make the vaccine mandatory as opposed to just voluntary? And, and what, what do you think, Amy? Can, can they? Well, I'll tell you, spoiler alert, um, in fact, you can. Um, just at the end of December, and I'm going to move some things here so I can get these slides changed easier. Uh, the EEOC came out with some guidance. There was some uh, more of an open question until about December on this front. But they have taken the position that, yes, there is a lawful, permissible way to do so. How you do so is, of course, the critical component. It needs to be non-discriminatory. It needs to comply with a number of other pro uh, protections at play. We, of course, recommend, as with many things in the employment arena, a clear written policy or program so that there's consistency with it. Um, and you're, you're properly considering uh, the limitations at play. There are uh, there there may need to be some exceptions. For example, Yvonne. Yes. What am I seeing Jeff Goldblum <laughs> on my screen. Yes. So if you're all wondering uh, like uh, why there was a dinosaur silhouette at the beginning and why we're looking at Jeff Goldblum, um, then I would encourage you to to watch uh, Jurassic Park uh, just like I did during the pandemic. I, I've I've rewatched all of them, including the recent ones. 
And something that came to mind while I was watching them and, and thinking about vaccines, as one does on, on a Friday night uh, during COVID-19, uh, is is there's this scene in, in Jurassic Park, which we're going to play to you very, very shortly, where Dr. Ian Malcolm gets brought in by industrialist John Hammond to advise him about the uh, dinosaur park that that uh, that Dr. Hammond has has created. Um, and uh, Jeff Goldblum, Dr. Malcolm uh, talks about uh his concerns with with the park and, and with the scientists amy will, will, you, will you play the clip you bet yeah yeah but your scientists were so preoccupied with whether or not they could they didn't stop to think if they should so dr hammond's bragging about his park and dr malcolm says yes yes but they didn't they were so preoccupied with thinking about whether they could they never stopped to think whether they should and i was thinking you know this is similar to the situation that I think employers and some of us are facing now is just because you can require the generally can require the vaccine, should you require it? And I think in getting to that answer, there are some things that you that employers need to consider. Uh, and, and we're going to be talking about seven of them today. Uh, very briefly, this is not a uh, you know a full guide of, of what you need to do you know we're happy to talk to people offline about that but just seven things that i, I think you should be on a checklist when if your organization's thinking about mandating the vaccine versus making it voluntary and they are employment discrimination which amy's talked about disability protections balancing occupational safety and health obligations labor related limitations even if you're not even if you don't have a unionized workforce uh, there's also additional state and local law constraints, really cool topic here in Oregon, uh, um, which we'll explain a little bit later. Wage and hour compliance, workers' compensation and insurance coverage, and lastly, reputation on employee concerns. So these are seven things that I, I think should be top of mind for employers. And, and I'll let Amy start off uh, with the employment dis uh, discrimination and disability protections. Amy? Super. Thanks, Yvonne. Apologies for the glitches here with our with our slides. Like like everything in in this remote environment, there are just are things coming along the way. So thanks for your patience. So, uh, big big um, overarching protections at play that really are um, fairly front and center in this context are the protections under the Americans with Disabilities Act. Of course, most states have an equivalent to that, but we're going to focus on the federal here just to illustrate this, which is. That law, of course, requires employers to not make decisions, not decide to hire or fire based on somebody's disabled status necessarily, not make discriminatory decisions. And more importantly, and we'll talk about this a little bit more as we get further into this issue, consider exceptions to work requirements. In this context, potentially requiring vaccines may require an exploration of exceptions where a vaccine requirement may intersect with somebody's disabled status. So that's the big picture takeaway that you want to make sure you've got in your sights as you're contemplating whether to mandate the vaccine. Other protections that aren't necessarily readily thought of as coming under the ADA are limitations. The purpose here is around privacy of medical information and limitations on employers' ability to inquire about um, disability status, accept where necessary, or generally to require medical exams. I know many employers years ago used to have standard physical fitness requirements, even for a desk job. There's a reason that has gone away, and this is one of the many reasons that has gone away. There are limited contexts where physical fitness it can be factored into the hiring decision. This is all a product of the ADA. Um, in its initial guidance, as I mentioned, that came out in December, the EEOC helped us with uh, by providing some clarity to say, okay, the mere act of vaccination isn't a medical exam. So we're not in that category that says, okay, um, you know, you may or may not be able to do this. And, but if you do, again, the standard there is job related and consistent with business necessity. So you can only require a medical exam if it's essentially mandatory for the business. Classic example right now would be um, firefighters 
Uh, physical fitness, obviously a big component of making sure they can get into that burning building and carry people out. That's job related and consistent with business necessity. But the EEOC has said, okay, the mere act of vaccination isn't a medical exam. So we're okay there, we can proceed. Hold on just a minute. Pre-screening right now under the vaccine requirements and the early authorization that exists under the vaccines that are available, there are pre-screening protocols that are part of the vaccine requirements now. Anyone administering it um, as a healthcare provider is obligated to do some pre-screening questions. Um, and those themselves may then change that analysis and become uh, a, an inquiry. So need to be carefully tailored and not overstep what's job related and consistent with business necessity. Here's, here's some added considerations. That's true if the employer is mandating it and performing the vaccinations. It's also true if the employer has engaged a third party to potentially perform vaccinations, maybe come on site. It is not true. It is no longer considered a, an employer inquiry if it's done by, for example, we've got vaccines available under our health care plan. You can go to this location and get them or we've we've identified a place where you can obtain them. That takes it out of that territory where you have to be very careful about making sure your inquiry is is tailored. The other exception that will that 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 can um, um, provide some protection for employers here from overstepping is if it's voluntary. If getting the vaccine is voluntary and the questions themselves are voluntary, truly voluntary, the employee doesn't experience a negative consequence, then they're not in this territory where they have to be able to prove that the questions were were narrowly tailored to only what's job related and consistent with business necessity. Now, of course, you can potentially argue that uh, a, a mandate, your questions are under that standard. So this is just, if you're gonna mandate, you have to make sure any questions asked meet that standard and you feel confident that you can prove it. Otherwise, you may wanna go down that road of voluntary or, or certainly um, having an external party. Now, the other big um, warning uh, danger zone for employers here is thinking that a, a mandate for vaccines, it can be absolute, meaning the moment somebody says no, they're fired. Um, the, there are some careful, careful um, um, steps needed here. For example, under that ADA, as I mentioned in the very beginning, one of the obligations, as I said, is not just to not hire based on perceptions related to limitations under a disability, but to explore exceptions or uh, adjustments to potentially the working environment that would allow an individual with a disability who's otherwise qualified for the job to continue working. Easy example of that is, say you have a call center and you have a candidate, and so you may have a sort of a standard height and standard setup, but you may hire somebody in a wheelchair. They may need that workstation lowered. They may need some things moved around. Uh, absent a, a, you know, major cost issues, which those typically don't get into, that's why it's an easy example, that's the kind of thing employers need to be uh, are obligated to explore before they get to the end of that road. Um, and so in this context, if somebody says, I've got a medical condition that may prevent me from getting the vaccine, it's very critical that employers know that they've triggered a potential protection that they need to honor and engage in what's called the interactive process, which is an exchange of information based on the individual employee's scenario that says, is there an exception we can make? For example, if somebody is on a medication that may have some sort of contraindication with the current vaccine, um, and th but that that, that uh, medication may have run, they may have run the course in three weeks. That might be okay. We can wait three weeks, or we can have you work from home for an additional three weeks, or maybe we give, <clears throat> excuse me, give you leave because we can't have you work from home. So being prepared for navigating those discussions. I've also mentioned here Title VII, although I've mentioned so far this under the ADA, Title VII also protects other categories such as religion. So if there's a religious exemption to vaccines, likewise, pregnancy, um, same general protocols there is the employer is obligated to work with the employee to determine if there's an exception that can be made that would prevent, uh, prevent them from losing employment entirely 
or not being allowed to work. Okay, so I get my technology working here. Lastly, under the ADA, um, there's also, as I mentioned, a desire for privacy around health information, things that tend to disclose disability. That uh, one of the takeaways from that is that's why anything with employee health information, health information needs to be maintained separate from the personnel file, separate folder typically, accessible only to those with a need to know. That is very much true in any um, vaccine program. You'd want to make sure that anything provided, for example, proof of vaccination needs to be maintained separate. You may also want to make sure employees know not to volunteer anything other than yes or no and proof of, of vaccination. So don't bring you their entire uh, medical file, but instead bring you only what's necessary so that you're not safekeeping more than, more than you intended. So that's our first consideration is all of the protections at play under discrimination um, laws. The second, and this is the big one, I think I mentioned in July, in fact, that much of, of the challenges with working in COVID or trying to figure out what can be done and what can't be done has been walking the tightrope of these privacy protections that come under some of these dis discrimination laws with the obligation to provide a safe and healthy workplace. Although the OSH, the Federal Occupational Safety and Health Act, has existed for a very long time um, and it didn't change, but it's sort of be come under new awareness because it imposes that, that duty on all employers. And in this context, you know, I think it historically was thought of as much more of a, that really applies to, you know, maybe a roofing job where they need to do tie offs or we're worried about hard hats or steel toed boots or those kinds of protocols. But now in the in the in the post COVID world, we're now aware that we're dealing with things like that that can impede the even in an office environment, you know, aerosols, uh, droplets. So we're looking at how do we prevent that? Things like you know masks, cleaning protocols, disinfectant protocols, the screening before letting folks in. Um, that's still in play. One big takeaway as we talk about vaccines that I should mention right up front here is. At present, there is no expectation that even if an employer were to mandate the vaccine, that that would excuse or accept them from masking, physical distancing, or the other requirements. Um, it is merely an additional precaution, protection, and, and hopefully potentially peace of mind for employees who are worried about worst case scenario, but it does not excuse the other, other protections. I should, I should mention also that the um, uh, OSHA themselves, the federal agency that administers the act, is currently recommending, encouraging their agents to get the vaccine, but not yet mandating it either. Now, under the new administration, we're already hearing rumblings that more or different steps will be taken, of course. Um, remains to be seen at, at present. So as, as of sitting here on March 2nd, um, we haven't seen that yet. But what, what we're hearing is that there is potentially an effort underway to come up with some more specific COVID-19 guidance that addresses a vaccine potentially requirement for certain employers. Um, based on the prevalence of the risk of COVID in that particular workplace or industry or those kinds of things. It would, um, the, 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 the buzz is that it may work similarly to bloodborne pathogens in the healthcare environment. If it does, here's the roadmap it might follow. It might require employers, again, where there's a particular um, risk factor at play, maybe you're, it's a business where distancing can't be maintained or there's a need for interaction, um, to provide vaccines at no cost, to provide training and education around vaccine um, efficacy, effectiveness, that kind of thing, to train uh, workers around those um, uh, the, the benefits of vaccines, again, to provide the vaccine at no cost, and then a special requirement around potential exceptions where the employee has to sign essentially a, a form that says, I know I'm supposed to do this, I know all of the risks, but I'm choosing not to do it anyway. Um, which brings me to the other note of caution. Um, as I mentioned when our, in our first um, consideration point, the discrimination protections, under our second bullet point, the occupational safety and health protections, there's also some potential um, safety nets that would prevent employers from potentially uh, terminating someone who wasn't able to get the vaccine. In this case, 
There's some um, not direct guidance in COVID yet, but e equating some agency guidance in another context where they basically said, if there's a vaccine requirement, even if that requirement can be proven to be legitimate, if an employee has an honest, good faith reason to oppose that because it may uh, pose a real danger to their to their health, so an allergy, for example, to some ingredient in the vaccine, um, they can't and shouldn't be necessarily immediately terminated. Different protection, but works very similarly to what I was mentioning under the under the ADA scenario, which is the big takeaway here is likely no major absolutes or at least certainly no absolutes without more process to determine if exceptions can be made or employers are going to get themselves in trouble. Okay, so with that, Yvonne, I'm going to turn it back over to you for our labor related content. Thank you, Amy. Um, so the one of the considerations that uh, uh, employers with union represented workforces uh, need to consider is uh, the the need to review the coll any collective bargaining agreements that the em the employer may have, and ask uh, whether there are any terms in that agreement that directly or indirectly address the vaccine requirement, and if a CBA term restricts the employer from imposing a vaccine requirement, then that employer would need an agreement from the union to require a vaccine. Now, I think it's unlikely that the CBA will have a, will address vaccines, at least maybe going forward it will, but not ones that uh, were in place already. Um, so, if, if, but if there is one, then the employer needs to notify the employees in the union that it's considering a vaccine requirement and then needs to be prepared to bargain. Uh, and before implementing the vaccine requirement, the employer is going to generally going to be required to bargain to agreement or an in, uh, or impasse. If there's no agreement reached, there are some limited exceptions such as business necessity or emergency that could apply, but those are pretty narrow. And I would recommend that the organization consult with legal counsel before proceeding to go forward with that. Um, and if there isn't anything specific in the agreement, then I would still notify the union uh, that you're thinking about it and then be prepared to bargain about those issues anyways. Um, so. It's also important for pe for employers are thinking, well, I don't have a unionized workforce, so I don't need to worry about this limitation. Uh, that's not necessarily true uh, because there's labor laws like the National Labor Relations Act that protects certain concerted activities of employees. And if employees take joint action together concerning, uh, in this case, the COVID-19 policy, uh, this may trigger protection. So you really need to be careful if there is a group of employees talking about uh, the vaccine together and, and taking joint action um, to not be running afoul of, of the various labor laws. Uh, the next consideration um, is that generally, uh, so right now I, I'm not aware that any state has mandated the vaccine requirement. Uh, if anything, they've. I think we've seen a, a a number of health or health de departments or agencies say that they're not there's no um, plan to mandate the vaccine and I, I don't believe I've seen anything from the federal government saying that they're going to either um, and the good news is that most states have federal law equivalents of the laws uh, of the federal laws which we've discussed so far um, but some of them are, are different either have different or heightened requirements or protections that need to be considered before mandating a vaccine. For example, Oregon has this weird law that's been in the books uh, for over 30 years that says that certain workers may not be subject to a vaccine mandate as a condition of employment unless the vaccine is required by law, rule, or regulation. That statute's ORS 433.4163. And 433.407 defines workers uh, to include uh, certain licensed healthcare professionals, firefighters, law certain law enforcement officers as defined by the statute, correctional officers, 
So it's if you are considering mandating a vaccine and you have a certain one of these workers, then you need to be careful about mandating it or just that should be a consideration because you could have the scenario where, you know, 90% of your workforce can be forced to get the vaccine with exceptions. Uh, but there's 10% that are maybe uh, exempt from this requirement altogether. I'd also, if, if you are, if you have any questions, look at the statute or talk to one of us. Because, for example, dental hygienists are included in the definition of worker if they're licensed. So really weird law. Oregon just does things its own way. Uh, I don't know if there's any change to this law coming in the future. I think it's been struck. Uh, talks of that have just died down as, as soon as they come up. So just another reminder to, to be careful uh, when implementing because you could be living in a state like Oregon that just has a weird law in place. Amy, uh, I think you're, I think the next thing they're talking about, if I haven't scared them enough with, with Oregon law, is wage and hour compliance. That's right. Well, and I'll, 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 I'll add there that Oregon is a bit of an outlier in that regard. And I'm not going to talk about California because that's not where either either Yvonne and I practice. But we do um, Washington, also Alaska, and, the, and not the same there. I suspect knowing Idaho, although I'm not licensed there, I would guess they're fairly hands off given their kind of approach to things, too. So that is a, a bit of a unique nuance to to Oregon. Um, OK, wage and hour compliance. Um, Again, if you're contemplating mandates, you want to make sure you've thought through this particular issue, which is um, there is some DOL guidance that talks about when is an activity considered compensable time, essentially when it is mandatory and it's required as part of the job. For example, um, there is some guidance around when drug testing um, is required that it, if it's within the you know, work hours and it's at the employer's direction needs to be compensated. Um, the same would be true potentially for employers who mandate vaccines. If it if it dips into the employee's work day, if it's something where it's like you've got to have it by tomorrow and they're spending their time trying to track one down, or if, even if they're on, on site um, in a line to get to get the vaccine, you want to make sure you've thought this through about whether whether you've mandated it in a way um, such that it is in fact no longer voluntary in any way. Um, in which case it probably triggers a payment obligation and you want to make sure you're obviously paying for that time to avoid what can can be very quickly um, costly mistakes when you don't pay something uh, on time, both uh, from a penalty standpoint, from an actual standpoint, and the attorney's fees are, are, are phenomenal in those cases fairly uh, quickly. So um, be thoughtful about whether you've mandated it to, to, to pay for it. Also costs right now, uh, we don't have costs associated with the vaccine, but if it's mandated and, it, and there is a cost associated with it, um, that should be an employer cost. Um, so the other thing that is really important, we said early, early on, most things in the employment arena benefit from a uniform policy or program that's, that's written. What's important is if it's not mandated, if you're merely encouraging it or voluntary, you want to make sure you very clearly articulated that to avoid the argument that, hey, I didn't know it was voluntary. I took time out of my day. Now I'm entitled to be paid for it. So you want to be thoughtful about that. Another small nuance, uh, leave it to Oregon again. Um, uh, there may be some pay equity issues. I'll talk about those more in a minute, but I just want to raise those since we're in the concept of wages. But before then, I'm going to turn it back to Yvonne to talk to us about workers' comp and insurance. And one more note on the on the wage and hour uh, compliance. In addition to you know the penalties for failure to pay on time. You know, it could, you could get a you could get into a situation where you not only have potentially a minimum wage violation, but also an overtime violation. If if that person had to wait in line for a while to get the vaccines, I I know that there's been reports where some people have been waiting all day just to find out that there's been some issue with them and they can't get vaccinated that day. Um, so just really really be careful with that. And there's some bully guidance on it too uh, for those of you in Oregon. Um, 
and yes, on the workers' comp on, on workers' compensation insurance coverage, I think the important here to know is you should be reviewing your workers' comp and other applicable insurance policies to see whether there's coverage or identify any potential limitations. Uh, so, for example, are adverse reactions or what some call immune responses to the vaccine covered under your insurance policy? Uh, and if so, does the vaccine actually need to be administered at the employment site or does it need to be off-site? Does it need to be during work hours, during not during work hours, in order to satisfy any other requirements in the insurance policy? Because you don't want to get into a situation where you're trying to do the right thing by having it uh, you know, on-site or off-site and it and turns out because of that you're, you've fallen out of, of, of coverage. Uh, Amy, back to you to one of my favorite uh, concerns or, or, or considerations when, when deciding whether to mandate a vaccine. Well, my system continues to be fun today. So the, the, our, our last one really is reputational employee relations concerns. Of course, there are, um, if, if this last 12 months has taught us nothing, um, it's taught us that there are certainly strong differing opinions uh, at play in our in our world right now. Um, and of course, the vaccine is is no different. There are strong opinions in each direction. There are obviously going to be customer preferences, sort of a community approach to things. But I think the big takeaway under this one is even if you've you've dealt with all of the pitfalls and the considerations that we've laid out to this point even if you've decided you can you'd like to you're ready to mandate um, obviously employee perception employee relations is a big driver here so even if you've done um, exactly everything correctly you feel like you've satisfied all of those things if you mandate and you lose 50% of your workforce or a portion thereof or key folks, um, you know, you're gonna be spending the time you thought you were getting back up to full speed or full steam again um, in the hiring process. So that is a really important um, uh, consideration. Other things that are coming up as folks are weighing them is what about um, adverse reactions that employees are having, how that is impacting um, people's comfort and and security around vaccines. Um, obviously, those tend to take on a life of their own when they get shared online and all of this begins to intersect again. You've got employee um, concerns about it, but you still may have strong customer opinions and community uh, uh, feelings about it. So this is really just a, hey, make sure before you proceed, stop and think about have we really balanced all of this with whatever these, how, however these manifest for our operation, for our location, and for our business? Um, what about alternatives? Door number three. Thank you, Amy. So if you're wondering, uh, well, that seems like a lot of work. There's a lot of considerations. It's not worth it. You, you know, what's the alternative? And I, I, one of them is just that you can strongly encourage and perhaps perhaps incentivize and big caveat on incentivize uh, your employees to get the COVID-19 vaccine, at least until we get further guidance or, in, or information is available. Or, for example, I don't know, something like OSHA requiring uh, the vaccine for certain types of environments Then I think, you know, you could weigh that against some of the other considerations. Um, but I, I so if, if you want to strongly encourage it, you might be wondering, well, how do I how do I do that? And, and there's a there's a number of ways you, you can encourage the vaccine without mandating. And they are they include, you know, developing the first step, I think, is to develop and distribute accurate, reputable COVID-19 vaccine education materials from the CDC and, and, and other sources, because, you know, it's going to be you, you should expect that it's going to be nitpicked. And that people are going to raise concerns because they web indeed something or they found some obscure article about COVID-19 being related to 5G or something like that. So make sure that your materials are, are reputable and they're accurate, that you provide multiple resources so people can say, look, it's not just the CDC, it's not just our local uh, health authority, 
it's everyone saying the same thing. Here's information about the differences between the two vaccines and one why one might make more sense than the other. I would also you can also make the vaccine accessible to employees either by having on-site uh, administration of the vaccine or recommending locations nearby uh, or making it really easy for employees to get the vaccine, for example, saying, hey, you know, we're all going to get it this day. Um, you can also explore and promote perks. Amy, Amy can talk to you a, a little bit about that uh, that can be made available through voluntary, voluntary and carefully designed wellness programs. I know that EEOC has kind of gone back and forth on this with recently withdrawing its uh, it's guidance, which kind of leads us back into the, well, we'll know it's bad when we see it. Uh, and, and and Oregon has their own guidance on it, uh, which I think seems a little bit more restrictive. Um, another way to encourage is to provide pay time off for employees to get the vaccine and recover from any potential side effects. Uh, one way, which I, I think is really interesting and just a cool way to encourage it is to lead by example and ensuring that management is vaccinated first or that there's public vaccinations. Uh, you know, for example, I think there was a study from some colleges a few years ago, uh, I think including the University of Oregon, where they had some of the student athletes be uh, vaccinated for the meningit meningitis. Uh, and it turns out if you had if you had a football player get vaccinated, it would increase the number of vaccinations by the by the student body by a huge percentage. So there's definitely ways to get creative with this. Uh, but there's still some risk, even if you just encourage, encourage the vaccine as opposed to mandate it. Yeah, and I'll, 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 I'll dovetail for just a second here, a little side note into the perks that you've mentioned, Yvonne. You know, one of the challenges there is that is another moving target. As, as Yvonne said, the EEOC has, has changed its approach. It may change it again, but, but what that is in reference to is any incentive that may um, in application end up benefiting well folks and potentially disadvantaging those with disabilities is under particular heightened scrutiny. And so the EEOC had, had come out with some guidance around when can we incentivize for, for things without becoming overstepping the line of discriminating against um, those with maybe health conditions that qualify as disabilities. So that one um, is one that needs to be thought through very carefully, um, often easier if it's through a health insurance program that is fairly neutral and already meeting its own non-discrimination standards. Likewise, we've got, and I, I mentioned this in a prior slide, the Oregon Equal Pay Act, um, again, another unique complexity to, to Oregon it may have some limitations, at least Boley has taken the position that um, there are now carefully comparable work has to receive comparable pay. There are only certain um, delineated um, legitimate reasons for a differential in pay and an incentive like this may run afoul of that. So be thoughtful, particularly if you're in Oregon, you want to be thinking about that if rather than uh, if you're offering, for example, a bonus, have you explored alternatives to that? So that one's its own its own pitfall. But um, taking away all of this, as we've said, this is again a moving target. Um, obviously what we've, I think, tried to, to illustrate for you here is mandating a vaccine now is going to be subject so, to some additional scrutiny. Um, Encouraging it now has its own complexities to it. It may change, as I said, if OSHA issues a requirement that it be done, this, this may no longer be quite the hefty consideration that it is today. So make sure, as with all things that we've uh, come across sort of in the last 12 months of this pandemic, stay tuned, stay informed, don't be an island, reach out for help as you need it. We're certainly here and, and, and available. So hopefully this has been helpful to you. I'm seeing things rolling in our Q&A and we've got just about 10 minutes for that, so. Okay. Amy and Yvonne, thank you very much for, for that insight. I have no doubt that that is gonna be very helpful for our accredited uh, business owners that have tuned in to today's webinar. We, uh, we do have about 10 minutes left, so I would love to 
start tackling some of the questions that we received during today's presentation. Um, one of the big ones being, is there any guidance as to need for vaccines in an enclosed office environment versus an open air warehouse? Is it okay to require for one type of employee versus another? Yeah, I think the answer to that would be is that starts to where you're delineating a requirement, you need to have a legitimate business reason for it, right? You need to have a business necessity reason for it. And so that's potentially a good illustration of a neutral business delineation around why criteria might be different for an office uh, person versus somebody who's maybe working out in the field and maybe they rarely have contact with another employee. It's really about potential risk factors. I suspect, by the way, um, one of the things under this proposed, you know, this potential OSHA guidance in this regard, it will, if, if it follows the bloodborne pathogens, we're hoping it will include some guidance around what are particular risk factors? I don't know that it will be, hey, every employer has to do this. There's going to be some criteria. And I suspect things like airflow, proximity to other employees may very well be, um, may very well be one of those criteria. Likewise, let's use that example to talk about exceptions while we're, while we're at it. So if you have an employee who maybe is in your office environment who has uh, an allergy to the vaccine, but you're thinking, hey, this is really the way we want to go. That's a perfect illustration of where maybe one of the things you explore is, can they work in this other environment? Can we create a station in our office environment to either get through a period of time or maybe potentially for the, for the ongoing um, um, period um, until at least the pandemic subsides? So that's an example, a good example of good potential criteria to explain the difference, sort of just, it's potentially discriminatory, what I would call with a small d, right? You're treating two categories of employees differently, but you're doing it on a legitimate business basis, not on their personal or protected status, merely on risk factors that you've associated. Those are all really great points. We, um, we had another question and you touched on this during your presentation a little bit, but rather than mandating vaccines, can we, as, as employers, can we provide incentives if employees choose to get vaccines? Yeah, so I'll, I'll jump in. And like, here's Great. one example of, of one that I, like a way that you can incentivize that it would be compliant uh, under at least Boley's more restrictive uh, interpretation of the Oregon pay equity law. And, and that incentive would be that you could say that every every employee will get a bonus. I don't know what the bonus amount would be. If a certain percentage of the workforce uh, either obtains the vaccine or is exempted of, from the vaccine because of a bona fide religious or uh, conviction or a disability. And if that's applied evenly, then I think that's that's a that's one way you can incentivize is and and there you could in, you can make it so that the number is a lot higher than, for example, fifty percent. You could aim for seventy five percent, which would in, which would mean that a significant part of your workforce is. Uh, getting vaccinated. So there are ways to do that. That's just one. But again, you just got to be careful to that you're not discriminating uh, with the big D as opposed to discriminating with the small D because discrimination in the workplace happens all the time. It's unlawful discrimination that you want to be concerned about. You know, you're discriminating based on uh, degrees and, and things like that, if it makes sense. Uh, so just having something that makes sense for your organization uh, and that isn't have, treating an employee differently because potentially they have a disability or or a religious belief. Thank you very much. We did uh, we did receive another question uh, regarding clients. More specifically, how do we handle clients asking about if our employees are vaccinated or not? That <laughs> that that one's tough, Amy. <laughs> You know, I, well, I'll I'll tell you. I I think the answer to that is. If it's individualized, I think the answer is you cannot give out somebody's health information, right? And so, um, uh, you know, we we're we're so sorry. We know we're taking every precaution. Uh, that's where that last consideration we talked about, kind of the magic number seven, really is. How do you juggle, you know, clients saying I'm expecting, you know, to come in and have everybody vaccinated, um, creates a tension point as you weigh these decisions, but. 
ultimately, I think the privacy of the employee outweighs the client concern with it. I think there may be ways you can communicate kind of safety protocols. You might even be able to share. Um, I think I think this would require a little more thought than and development than we have time to get into today. Potentially, you know, you can say, hey, our um, you know, we've got a significant portion of our workforce is vaccinated. We're thrilled about that. We've got a 90 percent success rate. You just want to be really careful about one oversharing and two making folks who may legitimately not be able to may very much want to get the vaccine but can't take it. You don't want them to feel um, um, sort of targeted, negatively viewed. You want to make sure that you're that you're promoting your safety protocols without oversharing or or creating any sort of vulnerability for your employees who maybe legitimately can't. Yeah, and I think there's there's even a win there for for you as as an employer because you could say you know we have strongly encouraged the vaccine and we we've achieved you know again this might require some more thought but we've achieved X percentage. And, mm-hmm. But we're also very proud that we have respected our employees' decision yeah. to not do it because of of several reasons, including their their beliefs. That's the kind of employer we are. Uh, so I, I think there's there's ways as long as you're educated about uh, why people generally choose not to get a vaccine or why they may not be able to. I think that's a winning point for your customers or or your clients to say. You know, we follow our law, we follow all laws that we that are applicable to us, including this one, which is, you know, we're not going to force somebody to get the vaccine when they're uh, uh, legally we're we legally can't do it. Um, I see the last question, Ben, about whether we expect this to ch- some of this advice to change. Can you uh, hang one second, Yvonne? Okay. I thought of something else on that last one I wanted to mention. I, I, I think the other piece. Sorry, I just want to mention it real quick. I think the other piece that's important, because it sounds like maybe the clients may have the misapprehension that vaccination of the workforce protects them. I think the reality is, based on the, based on the information available right now, vaccination is a peace of mind for the individual around not potentially having the most extreme cert- uh, reaction, potentially avoiding being quite as vulnerable to the disease. But all of, and I've said this early, and I want to just hammer this point, All of the safety protocols, masking, physical distancing, all of the activities a business should be taking will and should continue. So your clients should actually be just as safe visiting you, whether the employees themselves are vaccinated or not, so long as you're uh, following all those protocols. Sorry, I'll I'll, uh, I'll let you tackle the last one. I just wanted to get that. Oh, oh, no, no. Thank you. I mean, I, I, you know, the last one is just, yeah, some of this advice could change uh, and things, things are rapidly evolving. Uh, You know, if there's a different strain that's more contagious or, or more deadly, or there's a, or there's problems with the vaccine with, with, once you start getting more people vaccinated, you know, or time passes, you actually are able to tell, you know, the side effects and immune responses or more data. So think things could change. I, I, unfortunately, this is one of those topics where I, I think you just have to, you know, stay tuned and uh, be reading the literature out there to make sure that you're you're up to date with the most recent stuff. I, I know Amy and I share information about uh, the vaccine back and uh, about uh, what what different agencies are doing back and forth. And sometimes I'm like, oh wow, that is a uh, that is a lot different than what they were saying last week. So it's just you know, stay up to date. Talk to one of us if you have any questions. We might know the answer really quickly, or we might say that's a great question. When you find the answer, please let us know because uh, we'd be uh, very interested in that. I think the other piece, though, is there are a lot of moving parts. The framework, though, we've set forth, I don't think will change that much. Meaning, have you considered what the guidance is under each of these topics? as of the moment you're thinking about a mandate or a requirement or or making it voluntary. So hopefully we've tried to structure that as sort of your big picture, you know, that shouldn't change the answers under it, the regulatory guidance around it or the the sort of current climate around it may change or we may get cases that tell us more information about how it'll work out, but the categories themselves, kind of your checklist of have we thought these through shouldn't change too much. So that's the good news, despite the lack of a crystal ball for the big picture. We have about half a minute left. Amy and Yvonne, uh, thank you very much for taking the time to speak with us today. That was extremely helpful. We uh, we are very much appreciative. 
If, uh, if you had a question um, following what was presented today, you can send that to content at the BBB.org. We, uh, we will do the best that we can to supply some answers for you as a follow up to today's web webinar. If you would like to view today's webinar, we did record it. It's, uh, it's available on our YouTube page. We sent the link earlier. We will pass that around again. Um, if you would like to know about some uh, upcoming webinars that the BBB is hosting, you can view those at trust-bbb.org. Um, we really appreciate everybody taking the time to join us today, and we hope that you have a good rest of your afternoon. Amy and Yvonne, thank you again. Thank, thank you. you. Stay safe, everyone. Yeah, take care.